Live. So, um, yep. So I'm here with Jason Buck from Mutiny Funds. Um, if you don't know me, it's Adam Butler from Resolve Asset Management. Jason, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, this is going to be fun. So, um, you know, Jason, you've known, I think you've known Rodrigo for longer than uh, we've had a chance to to correspond. Um, how did how did you guys connect? Uh, I think I, I originally met Rodrigo in person finally in Miami at Context a few years ago, but I've actually been following the Resolve crew and your guys' writing for a number of years. I want to say going back four or five years um, because I came from kind of that global tactical asset allocation space. Um, so it was always loved what you guys put out there. And, and so it's just kind of a fan of reading all of your guys' work. And then it just turns out that uh, Rodrigo and I sat down to have uh, lunch together a few years ago in, in Miami. Well, that must have been like a, a Vulcan mind meld because Rodrigo <laughs> has always been, you know, front and center about tail hedging, you know, and he was one of the first guys in Canada to bring the Universal Fund um, series to Canadian retail investors and uh, is is continuously nudging us in that direction of making sure that we've got our, our tails covered, so to speak. So that must have been a really um, fruitful conversation. Yeah, it was, oh, it was no, fruitful. It, yeah, it was probably a lot of t it was a lot of tail risk talk, but I think even more it was a lot of uh, e foil talk at that time and and uh, paleo diets, keto diets, etc. So it was it was wide ranging. So yeah, it was, it was a mind meld on on more than one front. Yeah, that's quite a Venn diagram. Um, so so that's good segue. So Mutiny Fund, you guys uh, focus on tail hedging, but we've, obviously you're gonna you're gonna tell a little bit about your story and what mutual uh, Mutiny Fund does. But uh, how did you? come to have this vision to create this type of structure? Like what is your background and how did you grow into this? Sure, I'll give you a quick synopsis of my background. So just a lifelong entrepreneur, but also, you know, that stereotypical story. I bought my first stock at like 13, 14 years old. So I've always been fascinated with markets. So while I was building businesses over time, I was always trading and, and trading multiple asset classes and teaching myself how to trade over time and try to soak up as much information as I could. Um, when it came to the great financial crisis, I was a commercial real estate developer. And, um, you know, that pain that you felt when liquidity dried up, I never wanted to feel that pain again. And so I then from that point on, started teaching myself options, started teaching myself how to trade VIX, um, spent the better part of the last decade working on that. But at the same time, I was tracking a lot of the managers in the space. So, you know, it's a very small niche corner of our world. But, you know, there's some really great managers in the space and uh, working with the guys at RCM Alternatives, kind of tracking those managers over the last five to 10 years. Um, what I finally came to terms with is, is I'm probably a better entrepreneur than I am a trader. And so looking at all the different path dependencies that happen in a risk off environment, I thought it was better to find very niche specific traders that can handle those different path dependencies. And then as you guys are big fans of, I created an ensemble basket of those managers so we could cover as many path dependencies as possible. But it also springs out of, you know, post GFC, you had a lot of people, family and friends that were reading, you know, Nassim Taleb books or a Chris Cole white paper, even Spitznagel's book. And they go, great, I read it. I want to protect my portfolio. How do I become more robust or anti-fragile? And I go, great, do you have $20 million? And they say, no, well, I'm like, there's no options for you. So just my partner, Taylor Pearson and I got tired of having those conversations and there being nothing in the marketplace. So we spent the better part of the last couple of years figuring out how could we be the first ones to bring a tail risk or long volatility product to, you know, retail clients that are, you know, accredited, but may not have that, you know, level of 20 million plus to be able to invest in these tail risk managers, where we could create a better basket, we felt of an ensemble of these managers and offer retail access for as low as $100,000 US. So who's the target for this? It's You say it's sort of retail investors, or I guess, distribution through advisors um, mm -hmm. who get it. Um, yep. What role do you see this playing in portfolios? I see you've, you've sort of got a, a neat arc, um, like a narrative arc on your own podcast. And you start with this concept of diversification, which is obviously near and dear to our heart and resolve. Right. So, so, so how does tail risk or, or you know, the mutiny vision of, of how to manage tail risk fit into portfolios? 
Sure. Uh, we view it as, as a couple of different ways. And we built this, you know, by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs initially. Uh, Taylor's audience is primarily uh, 25 to 40 year old entrepreneurs, a lot of which have had their first liquidity event. And so we look at, you know, tail risk with an entrepreneurial eye, right? As you guys know all too well, we care more about drawdowns than we do necessarily volatility because we, we need to be able to eat those returns at the end of the day. So with that aspect, we, we, we catered it primarily towards younger entrepreneurs. But as you know, everybody needs sequencing risk protection, especially uh, retirees. So that's just another fit for it. Um, but going back to, I love, like I said, global tactical asset allocation portfolios like you guys build. And I've been a fan of that and been building those for over a decade. But what always was concerning in the back of my mind, I always have this nagging voice in the back of my mind, what if, what if, what if? And what if, you know, if, if markets are in an uptrend, you had a sharp sell-off. And typically people go, well, in 87, they were in a downtrend. In 2006, 2007, they were in a downtrend. I go, yep, yeah, those aren't statistically significant. What this happens, and unfortunately, we just saw that what happens in March. So we just view that layer of long volatility or tail risk as part of the overarching portfolio. So if you go back to like Chris Cole's white paper um, on the Dragon portfolio, the 100 year portfolio, he has 20% each roughly in stocks, bonds, gold, commodity trend, and long volatility tail risk. Um, that's kind of the way we look at uh, a nice, well functioning portfolio is it, you need that long volatility tail risk um, as part of that overarching portfolio like you guys build because you need that phase shift. You know, typically when we move, from risk on to risk off, it's a very violent phase shift. And we'd like to capitalize on that, monetize it, and then roll those profits into maybe commodity trend if we have a prolonged recession, or if markets V back up, like we saw, none of us know the future. So we want to be prepared for as many path dependencies or eventualities as possible. So you, you construct the mutiny portfolio, as you say, an ensemble. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that mean an ensemble of different option-based strategies or are there a number of other types like short-term trend following and VIX trading and, you know, is, is it, how do you think about the ensemble? Uh, D, all of the above. It's two layers of ensembles. So we look at it as, as buckets. We have a, a, a VIX bucket, which is VIX uh, arbitrage colloquially called, but it's more relative value VIX trading. Uh, we have another bucket that we call our dynamic options, which is those tail risk options. And we have a third bucket that we call dynamic futures or short-term futures, to your point, like short-term trend following in futures, even intraday. Um, so within those buckets, we, we view those gives us the three primary buckets of path dependencies for risk off scenarios. They also cover each other nicely and they trade different market microstructures, whether it's VIX options or those Delta one futures. But then within those buckets, we also like to diversify across managers within that buckets that have different um, idiosyncratic risks or idiosyncratic ways they look at capturing or monetizing those returns with different path dependencies. And to your point, what you pointed out so well is they have different deductibles. So you have the premium you paid but then you need that path dependency to, to have, reach your deductible hurdle. So we try to layer in those deductibles even within that options bucket. Because as you know, this stuff is very dynamic and none of us know these path dependencies. So we wanna layer in as many path dependencies as possible. Hopefully more than one manager will monetize it, but we always have a position on across the, the variable spectrum. So do you have a good grasp of your um, expected impulse? to a, a market downdrift? I mean, if you've got, obviously you can quantify the expected Delta and Vega and Theta and Volga and mm -hmm. all that stuff on an options portfolio or on a, you know, a, a, an aggregation, an ensemble of options portfolios. It's obviously harder to quantify the, some of those important dimensions of the tail hedge within the ensemble. How do you guys think about that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct. I think that a lot of times we fool ourselves in creating, if we line up the Vega, the Delta and the Volga, like this is a, if we give a shock test, this is what our returns will look like. Well, it's, it's not that simple. And so the way we view it is, you know, I think Nancy Davis uh, said it best is it's debit card investing when you're buying options. You know what the cost is to when you buy that option, you don't know what the path dependency or the monetization of that return is gonna be. And that's why we try to cover as many of those paths as possible. But by overlaying those and over different uh, deductible horizons, whether it's from negative five to negative 15 down, from negative 15 to negative 30, from negative 30 and beyond, we like to overlay those. And so I wish, I mean, I, I just, I always, like I said, I have this nagging voice in the back of my head that says, you cannot give me a precise number 
for what that risk off is going to look like and what that return is going to be. So that goes back to the ensemble approach. It's like, I want to cover it with as many overlaying managers as possible because you never know what that path dependency is going to look like. It's it's almost like a Heisenberg uncertainty principle yeah. in, in so far as you've, you know generally that you've got a, a, a state of the market covered. You yeah. can't quite quantify the state. You can't yeah. quantify the probability of the state. Exactly. You can't quantify the exact impulse that you're going to get when the state occurs but you've got you, you know you've got the ground covered but you don't quite like you only know what it really is going to look like when you observe it in the moment you can't exactly. you can't anticipate it which which always i always find this is one of the harder questions when you think about how to allocate to head to tail head strategies mm -hmm. how do you size it right typically in a portfolio right. you size something based on some kind of Either it's expected marginal sharp ratio, that's sort of the more traditional way to think about it. There's maybe it's expected marginal, expected value at risk or something like that if you wanna get really fancy, but it implies some sort of ability to estimate A, the probability of gains and losses and B, the magnitude of gains and losses. Different metrics imply symmetry or not, whatever. Right. Either way, in this case, as you say, we don't really have a good sense of the probability of that, whatever that type of market environment is that will, will crystallize gains from this type of strategy. And then not only don't, do we not know the, the probability of it, we don't know the expected payoff, right? Yeah. But it's, yep. it's kind of like you want something in your hip pocket that you've got a high confidence is going to do something right. when you need it, but you don't right. know quite what need it means. You don't know quite what something is. Right, yeah. but, but I, even still, I actually really sympathize with with this vision because it explicitly acknowledges what I think I, I find most discomfort with tailhead strategies, which is the the hubris in in believing mm -hmm. that you can anticipate the the shape of the tail that you are hedging, the magnitude, you know, what security is gonna is is gonna exhibit the tail. What is the, the rate at which the tail is going to manifest? And what is the depth? How quick is the recovery? Right. We No one knows all that stuff, right? So, you know, option specific guys, they create ladders, they create conditionalities to minimize the carry and they trade around it and all that kind of stuff. But you still don't know what the trade-off is going to be. Is it going to hit the point at which you actually get paid on the premium or is it just going to, you're just going to pay the, the deductible. You're not going to get paid. Right. So I, I actually really sympathize this. Is that kind of, is that how you guys thought about it when you were creating yeah. this product? So this, it, it comes it's exactly from the scratch your own niche. So Taylor and I were looking for products for ourselves. So we started looking at all the managers in the space and said, okay, if I, you know, invest with this manager and I put a quarter million with them, I'm implicitly saying I, their path dependency is going to be right. And so that is untenable for me because I have this voice in my head that says, what if, what if, what if? And so to your point, like I, I know we've gone back and forth sometimes in the DMs and stuff and, and thinking about the way you talk about it is like, if, you know, since 1980, if we only have like three, four or five of these events, we don't have enough sample size to really, like you're saying, we can't mathematically put a figure on, you know, how do I offset my portfolio? So the way we try to think about it a lot is like by creating an ensemble approach, and this is what you guys are so great about with ensembles and, and, and looking at a basket of ensembles, is by you know creating stuff that are fairly robust and fairly uncorrelated, we can hopefully harvest that rebalancing premium over time. And that way during a risk on cycle, if we're flat at zero, fantastic. We've done an amazing job while still being open to all that convexity during a risk off event. And that's Speaking the way we look at it. rebalancing actually, yeah. so are you rebalancing across managers on a regular basis as well? Sure, so the heuristic we use is that we rebalance quarterly and then unless a single manager is up double digits in a month, then we'll then we'll take from that winner and redistribute across the losers, and hopefully over time that creates a ratchet like effect to our portfolio, where we cruise along as like flat, maybe slightly positive, slightly negative. Then you'll see some sort of pop in volatility or option space. We 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 try to monetize that, which is as you said key, and then we cruise along at that next plateau, we're waiting for the next event. The it's it's as hard as you said it is as far as even putting these trades on, but people don't even it's exponentially actually harder to monetize the trades as you referenced, just like, not only like, do they monetize, how do they monetize, and how much do you monetize knowing if there's a second or third leg down from here? Are you protected well, on that, that decision? leg? Is it the manager that makes the decision, the underlying manager makes the decision about whether they're gonna crystallize gains intra 
intra-month or intra-redemption period, they distribute it. And then if you get a distribution intra-month and you'll, I mean, obviously you can't subscribe for new units intra-month. So you'll have, or can you? We can't. Well, depending on the manager, um, it's a function of AUM, but with most of our managers, we have separately managed accounts. So we're, we're seeing that intraday, we have that okay. intraday liquidity. And so, yes, if we wanted to, we could, but we also like to let them do their own thing. But that's why we, we talk very specifically about what their monetization processes are. And we try to have different managers with different monetization styles. And so that's part of it, that overlapping process. Um, but we get to, yeah, we get to see those trades intraday. And like I said, rebalance monthly or quarterly, depending on what's going on in the marketplace. Okay. So we, it, we still, I think, need to drill into sure. how a potential client, an investor or an advisor should think about sizing mm -hmm. this investment, right? What, what's the, what's the expected carry? How do you, how do you size it based on, you know, it's tough to know what the expected, the expected payoff is. By the way, I would say this to almost any, I'd say this to an equity manager or a yeah, bond yeah. manager. I exactly. talk to consultants all the time and they're always asking me about capital market expectations and what's the expected return on risk parity. And I always say, well, it's, the expected return is higher than what you're getting on your traditional portfolio, but I have no idea what that is. You know, like it's, yeah. uh, I have no capital market expectations. Everything is sort of relative. So I think it's the risk parity portfolio if done properly is relatively more attractive on a risk adjusted basis, but I have no sense of exactly what the slope of the capital market line is. Right. So yeah. I don't need to put it, put you on the spot here, but I do think it's an interesting yeah. question about how to think about the expected carry versus the expected payoff versus the, you know, I'm at a capital that you need to commit to this as a as a long term strategic investment. How do you guys uh, think people should think about this? Sure. And that's why I was excited for us to have a conversation, because we're both epistemic humility guys. We admit that we can't predict the future and we just do our best in the interim. Right. And so um, there's multiple ways to think about it. As always, with any sort of portfolio construction, you have to have a minimum of 10 percent allocation to any sleeve or else it's not really going to you know, ballast or buoy your portfolio at all. The other way on the far extreme is to look at this as um, my partner, Taylor Pearson has coined the term like an entrepreneurial put option is as an entrepreneur, I may want to have all my assets in a long volatility tail risk position because, you know, my house, my car, my business, my job, my, my girlfriend's business, all of these things are implicitly short volatility, right? They go up with the market, you know? And so I want to ballast that overarching portfolio, but that's a, that's a deeply much more philosophical thing that is hard sometimes to wrap your head around. So scaling back a little bit, the way I like to think about it is you want to uh, ballast or offset those implicit short volatility uh, products in, in your investment portfolio. So, you know, implicit short volatility, we're talking stocks, bonds, real estate, PE, VC, you know, all those things are implicit short volatility. Um, and what I mean by that is they're harmed by volatility. You know, during a risk on times, they're great, but then they, they flip during a risk off. Um, so if you think about, if you balance those out 50-50, um, you know, your stock bond portfolio with this sort of uh, long volatility, that's going to help you compound wealth over time. What's I, actually very interesting, I think, to you is that the way I think about it, you know, for some reason, people have, we've glommed on this idea of the 60-40 portfolio, right? 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And if you guys have written so well about, that's really 90% stocks when you think about the risk adjusted basis, right? So when I, when I mention this, and I just point out mathematically, actually, if you think about it, your short volatility, let's just use stocks for this example. Let's just use some rough numbers. Let's say stocks have a 10% return with a 50% drawdown, right? If I'm balancing them with a tail risk long volatility strategy that has small drawdowns, but large returns every once in a while, you know, that say there, so you have negative 10% drawdowns and you have then a 50% return in the sell off. So it's the opposite of the stocks. You actually should be 40% stocks, 60% long volatility tail risk in that sort of scenario. And that balance, because of the huge tail risk to the stock position, is that portfolio combination rebalanced over time will compound wealth better than any other system I've seen. So I guess this, this dovetails well into the discussion of the, um, oh, what's Chris Cole's portfolio? You mentioned it earlier. Dragon. The Dragon portfolio. Yeah, before yeah. we get there, I yep. want to just sort of, I want to glom onto this idea of entrepreneurial risk because yep. I think it's important for advisors to also recognize that they're entrepreneurs. And yeah. so, and, and, you know, as, as Meb and Corey and Wes and all yep. these guys have constantly harped on the reality that an advisor is typically double or triple levered to equity mm -hmm. beta, right? Because yep. their fees, 
you know, their ability to maintain clients plus their fees. All of these are, are highly sensitive to the return on equities. If the equities could cut in half, in all likelihood, their book of business gets cut, cut by, you know, uh, a third at least, right? Mm -hmm. So their income goes down by a third. So from an advisor as an entrepreneur standpoint, this is something that you should probably be thinking about as a way to hedge the, not only the true risks in your client portfolio, but also the hedge on your own book of business. So you get a double whammy on the benefit from trying to think through better ways to uh, to, to manage your tail risk um, on your book of business. Um, so, so with that said, just in terms of the Dragon portfolio, Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really, what's so great about that is it's sort of like your ensemble can be considered as one sleeve of the broader ensemble, right? Where right. you've, you've broadly got assets that are not just sort of responsive to the typical macroeconomic risks that we, we always harp on, which are typically, uh, infl inflation surprises or growth surprises, but also convexity, right? So, um, if, if you sort of think about risk, traditional risk parity, managing the risk of inflation and growth shocks, the Dragon portfolio adds this extra dimension, which is this convexity dynamic, right? Where you've got certain assets that are strongly pro-cyclical. And, and I know that, that option managers don't really define convexity in this way, but I yeah. think it's a useful construct to think about yeah. it as having assets that do very well in, in pro-cyclical environments, um, or risk on type environments and other uh, other types of, of markets that do well or strategies that do well in risk off environments. And strategies like risk parity do very well typically in risk in, in risk on environments, while stuff like intermediate to longer term managed future strategies, for example, do well in a certain type of risk off environment, but they're not sort of short term risk off environments. They are longer term or like right. if you measure your skewness or your convexity on a on a quarterly basis, like many institutions do, then intermediate to long-term trend following is complementary from a convexity standpoint to a typical uh, endowment or pension portfolio. If you measure it at a more, uh, at a higher frequency at the sort of mm -hmm. monthly, weekly, or daily level, then you need to look to other alternatives. So I think, do you, do you guys see, your type of strategy and tail strategies in general as kind of fitting into that sleeve? Yeah, I think I, I like to go back historically and I, ho I hope you agree with me on this is like, it actually, this this I, this concept around risk parity or dragon portfolio, all it dates back to Harry Brown in the 1970s when he came up with permanent portfolio, right? 25% yep. stocks, bonds, cash, and gold, right? And then, you know, Dalio came along. I wish we'd paid a little more respects to Harry Brown, but he, you know, he vol targeted the bonds with the stocks, which made sense at the time. And then, you know, quite frankly, Chris Cole's Dragon Portfolio is just a modernized version of permanent portfolio to me. And so that's yep. why I've always been building from a permanent portfolio basis, right? Is that was the, to me, that's the foundation that you build the in intellectual lattice work on top of. And then, so if I think about that permanent portfolio, stocks, bonds, uh, gold, and cash, um, what I think is interesting is if we modernize that a little bit, you can take that gold position because that's supposed to be there for inflation or maybe default, you know, deflationary default. But you take that gold position and you substitute commodity trend, you know, or, or, or managed futures. And that gives you maybe a more dynamic gold bucket, right? Maybe partial gold part commodity trend. Then you take your cash position. And if you use long volatility tail risk, to your point, that's a convex cash position. That's the way we kind of look at it. So if yeah. we go to Chris Cole's Dragon portfolio, as I said, it's 20% each, basically stocks, bonds gold commodity trend and, and long volatility tail risk. And what you're doing is if you have 40% in stocks and bonds and 40% in long vol and commodity trend, those are basically balancing each other out. Because as you know, stocks and bonds are a convergent trade. And then the divergent trade is your tail risk and your commodity trend. And then you have this 20% gold, which I'll let other people argue about that. But you know, you have that, it's, it's not anybody else's liability. So at least maybe you have some you're taking away the fiat risk with gold. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get in the whole gold bug argument, but um, that's the way we look at it is, is more balancing out your implicit short volatility and your long volatility. The way to look at it is you just have short vol or long vol assets. You either have conver you know, convergent trades or divergent trades. It's really the world kind of breaks down into those segmentations. And the other yeah, way so we look at it, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 you go ahead. Uh, the other way we look at it too is like uh, this, and this is a simplification is like you either have long vol or short vol style of trading, convergent or divergent, 
And then I look at it as you have correlated, uncorrelated, and negatively correlated. Correlated would be your equity beta. Negatively correlated is your tail risk options. You know, they're structurally negatively correlated. Then if you add commodity trend, which is uncorrelated, those are basically the three fundamental or structural correlations you have. Everything else is a statistical correlation that, as we know, changes over time. Yeah, is a derivative of those, right? Yeah, and it's yeah, it's it's so great that I mean, I just love this idea of the um, why can't I ever remember the the dragon portfolio? Yeah, you know, yeah. I played Dungeons and Dragons. You know, you'd think dragon would be would be tip of my tongue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I I like the idea of the dragon portfolio as just really an extension of risk parity, right? Like, yeah. yep. you're thinking about risk on a on, you're adding an extra dimension maybe to, to how you think about mm -hmm. risk. You know, you invoked, uh, I think it was Kaminsky who describes um, trades either as either convergent or divergent. Yep. Yep. I think that's a great framework, um, sort of an analog to positive or negative convexity. Um, so you sort of add this, this divergent, convergent convexity type language or dimension to, um, to risk parity. And, you know, one of the things that we've, learned as our understanding of risk parity has evolved is that, um, you know, risk parity really is not about your allocation of stocks and bonds. That's sort of, that, that's an example of risk parity, but really it's about trying to maximize your diversification across as many structurally diverse sources of risk as possible. And so, right. you know, it's not really, it's not limited to stocks and bonds or even stocks, bonds and commodities. It's not limited to commodity trend, even though carry, is a distinct mm -hmm. risk premium. Um, mm -hmm. Skewness is a distinct risk premium. Seasonality is a is an anomaly. Low volatility is like you've got all these different value, all these different um, uh, orthogonal sources of risk that are some you know some of them are sometimes correlated with one another. The one great thing about uh, tail hedges is that they are by design negatively correlated with cyclical risk. Right. Exactly. So. That really is the only one you could count on. And I think certainly uh, investors since the early 80s have been lulled into a false sense of security about uh, the probability the treasuries will always act as a risk off asset, right? I mean, pretty well in every yeah. major equity sell off since 1982, treasuries have been, um, you know, a, a beautiful diversifier against against equities. But if you go back to the 1970s and into other earlier periods, there are long stretches where government bonds are positively correlated to equities and where they sell off together. They have the drawdowns at the same time. And so they, they cannot be counted on. The 70s were particularly interesting where, you know, yep. you've got stocks and bonds have their have negative returns, negative real returns over a full decade or more. They have their, their worst drawdown at the same time. At the same time, commodities and gold produce double digit compound returns every year mm -hmm. over that same period. And so just highlighting the importance of, of that sort of just general global risk parity diversity um, and, and where you really get into the value of some of these uh, divergent type trades is specifically in some of these really abrupt uh, drawdown periods like we've just like we've just witnessed or even in the 2000, 2003 period or the um, 2008, nine period where Longer term or intermediate term uh, trend also delivered positive returns while while stocks uh, drew down. So, you know, it's I just I love this idea. Are you guys having a lot of conversations about specifically where your strategy fits in fits into a dragon portfolio type yeah. construct? I mean, we've been we've been getting pinged yeah, on that exactly. pretty consistently. The last uh, number Sean had given me was like over ten thousand people had read the dragon portfolio white paper. So. We get uh, we get pinged a lot via Artemis, and and uh, my partner Taylor Pearson wrote a great synopsis of the paper that I think is uh, you know trending at number one if you Google it as far as the synopsis of the dragon. So you know we try to be a little smart about our SEO. Um, so yeah, we get a lot of pinging about that, but I think that's uh, it's a high level discussion, and I think part of that discussion is and and what we're building towards eventually is like to do a lot of these strategies requires a lot of uh, in house maintenance and kind of managing the cross margins and the correlations and the cash efficiency in house. You guys know this very well as well as like you know we can say you know that our long volatility tail risk is a ballast against your your stocks and bonds, but if the client is holding those stocks and bonds you know, on a, in a different account, in a different system, it, it makes you hard to balance those out. 
So that eventually we're trying to offer those kind of solutions. Like one of our next one we're rolling out is a hundred to hundred portfolio where we offer you hundred percent mutiny, long volatility balanced out with a hundred percent S and P exposure that we rebalance monthly. And so we're able to do that in house with a lot more cash efficiency. And it's a, just a much better product for the client over time. So you build those out, you know, like to your point, it's, it's really hard to have this tail risk piece. And so Taylor and I built that first because it was so hard to have retail clients have access to tail risk or long volatility. So we wanted to build out that piece of the dragon portfolio first. Um, next thing we'll probably tackle is like, what does it look like to build a basket of commodity trend managers? You know, as you know, with different lookbacks, you know, you guys are great about, you know, ensemble parameters of lookbacks. And that's the same way we think about commodity trend. You need short, medium and long term, and you need a basket of those as well. But those, somebody needs to build that for the retail client to have access to, because it's, it's incredibly difficult to have access. You know, you point out something I, 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 think about a lot. And it's so interesting is like, people like to argue about the stock and bond allocation of permanent portfolio, I mean, of, of, of risk parity, but they forget about the other side, those ballasts of like gold and cash. And so the way we think about it that you touched on is what happens if they correlate again with stocks and bonds, I'm going to need something a little bit better than gold or cash to offset that risk. The other, the other way to move forward from that too, is I think about when you move from a risk on environment, that's great for stocks and bonds. And you then we move to that 70 style environment that's great for commodity trend. To get there is almost a paradox because you need to go through a, a very violent phase shift. So that's the way we view it, is that tail risk or long vol is going to make money in between. That shift is going to be so violent that we want to monetize that and then maybe roll the commodity trend. So I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to jump forward on this and you're eventually going to get there. But it's like the Asnes to Leb debate. You know, they're both actually right. You know, I want tail risk to monetize that sharp sell off. But then in a prolonged recession, I want to roll into to trend, into CTA trend or managed futures. I mean, so it's it's not either or, it's both, right? And that's, I know yeah. we both view the world that way is like, going back to you guys, or you're, you're talking about the nuances of each sleeve of asset class you can be in, is at the end of the day, they're all either short vol or long vol, but I want to create a huge ensemble of that. So essentially I'm getting beta, right? What you're essentially doing, the way I look at it, maybe it's too simplistic, but if I have a beta of, of an ensemble of managers that are short vol, and a beta of, of managers, ensemble of managers are long ball, I have a much more robust signal with less volatility, less drawdowns, and I can balance those out against each other and rebalance it over time and compound wealth without sequencing risk for multiple decades. Because we never know- You're minimizing it. Yeah. Minimizing, yeah, minimizing. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, though, how do you sort of think about the, the without being specific, right? Yeah. Um, how do you think about the carry? on this portfolio. I mean, I, I, I find it really hard to think that you can both effectively like have, have very, very high confidence that yep. you will be positioned to capture the tails yep. and to be very specific about, about hedging the tails that everyone wants to hedge Yes. without expecting to have to pay a premium for that. I mean, obviously you could have risk-free returns, which I mean, notwithstanding, that this is obviously what the Fed is trying to provide yeah. at the moment. Um, how there's, there's got to be some kind of negative carry, and I know that you, um, or my understanding is that you guys have an ensemble of different ways to manage, yeah, or different managers that manage that negative carry in a variety of different ways, which I think is prudent. But just how much negative carry can you diversify away? Do you think while still having confidence in the hedge? Sure. So yeah, it's, it's the key thing we worry about most is the way we construct the portfolio is we want to stuff as many options in there as possible. Because as we talked about earlier, you know that death by a paper cut, you know, a thousand paper cuts of the options, but you don't know your upside risk. So that's that's more prudent for us is you don't have blow up risk if, you have, if you're solely buying options. So we the bulk of the portfolio is buying those tail risk options. And we use a, a variety of managers that create dynamic strategies for that, whether it's, you know, straddles, strangles, outright puts, um, those sort of, we layer those risks in and we try to cover as many of those as possible. But then as you alluded to, you have that, that bleed typically of options. So the way we try to cover that bleed of options is that's where we have our, our volatility arbitrage or volatility relative value traders. And what they're doing is they're picking off the difference between implied and realized volatility or different structures in the VIX curve, which provides almost like a, a more stream of income trade that's hopefully offsetting that bleed of, of buying the options. Right. I see. So they, there's a there's a portion yeah. of the portfolio that is you 
pretty well know in advance has a fixed cost. So there is a fixed mm-hmm. negative carry to a portion of the portfolio. Sure. But that's there for a purpose. And that purpose is to ensure that there's always a, a proportion of mm-hmm. uh, tail protection. You've always got some insurance on. Mm-hmm. And then some other proportion of the overall portfolio will be positioned properly. Some other portion will not be positioned properly because they'll be trading around those hedges to try to offset some of the carry. But you're still guaranteeing a, you know, a, a certain minimum amount of positive convexity from having the outrights. Right. And not only do we have the dynamic managers that are managing the option strategy, but by dynamically managing the option strategy, you might not have full put protection on. Right. That's why we brought back in those uh, the fixed relative value for not only that positive carry, but we also have our short term futures, which is intraday trend that short futures, because as you alluded to, if you have a March like event and implied volatility expands, those options become much more expensive. Mm -hmm. So that's why if we just have the delta one shorts of futures where they can just directly short the S&P or the world markets intraday, that allows them to us to go short without paying up for that higher premium. So those are the kind of the three buckets, but given those three buckets over a risk on cycle and rebalancing those ensembles, we felt we had enough positive carry where we added back in those very uh, simplistic put ladders. I mean, they're not quite that simplistic, but that gives us a very definitive sleep at night portfolio, where if some sort of exogenous event would happen on a Saturday or Sunday, and somehow all of our managers weren't positioned for it, we're sitting on those uh, put ladders that we use a negative 20% attachment point to talk about your deductible again, is we feel we can maintain the bleed of that by the positive carry of the rest of our portfolio. Because at the end of the day, it's it's Taylor and I have our own skin in the game. We have our family skin in the game. So we have Thanksgiving risk. And so it keeps me up at night to make sure we're, we're as covered as possible. The, the d- deeper problem that I think you're eventually hinting at is like, what happens after March, right? You get that sell-off in March, implied volatility expands. And even though volatility is crushed back down, you know, and we have dynamic managers that know that's going to happen. And like I said, we can, we can short intraday those markets on a Delta one basis. But how do you, you know, get ready for the next leg down. And to your point, that's where you unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, I think you have to take a little basis risk, right? You have to start thinking about interest rates, uh, metals, treasuries, you know, those sorts of, you have to start putting on some more dynamic hedges. And that's fine after that risk off events happen. The problem is when you have dynamic hedges on before and you go from low vol to high vol, historically a lot of those spreads get blown out and those managers get taken away on stretchers. But mm-hmm. after that event, it becomes a little more prudent to put on some more option spread trades and maybe go, you know, put long option spreads on on treasuries, or et cetera. So you do have to take, I think, a little bit of that basis risk to reduce some of that higher bleed that now you're going to experience, given, okay. you know, what the market's giving you. I'm tracking. Hold on. I'm going to see if I can reset my. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. OK, mm. good. Um, so one of the one of the things that we've actually experienced in practice um, because we've actually rolled out tail hedge strategies to our clients mm-hmm. as line items on there. Uh, right, we right. also have a wealth book in Canada and the US. And so we have tried as a line item to have um, allocations to series of tail risk strategies, like I mentioned, the university, for example. And right. it has just been an enormous behavioral headwind mm-hmm. for clients. You know, um, we describe the merits of the strategy. We describe exactly what yeah. they should expect in terms of um, the constant bleed. We have no idea that it's going to pay off. We don't <laughs> We don't have a, 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 a precise view of how much it's going to cost in the meantime that we, you know, we could kind of ballpark it, but just having this item on the, on the portfolio that decays to zero, then you need to re-up. And I know that's not really how you, or you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that's yeah. how yours is structured. At least no. that's not the expectation of it. But having right. this sort of constant bleed and then having to re-up, constant bleed, re-up is just behaviorally intractable for, mm-hmm. for clients. And I think a lot of what happened, I'm just surmising here, but I suspect that a lot of what happened in terms of the CalPERS fiasco, the Alberta uh, pension fiasco, where they had these tail hedge programs in place for many years and they they pulled them right in advance of this sell-off was just boards or the CIO office saying, you know, this is this is a constant bleed. I don't believe we're going to have one of the, these events. I don't have confidence that it's going to pay off as expected. Whatever yeah. it is, I mean, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the affective theory of decision-making. So we feel, we act, then we rationalize. And so I think a lot right. of these, a lot of people sort of, they feel 
and that feeling builds up over time as there's constant losses, those feelings build up. You want to act to eliminate that um, pain. You right. act and then you rationalize, right? And there's any right. number of different rationalizations that you can bring to bear. But ultimately, it's because it, you, you experience pain over a, a sustainable period of time. So how do you think about and how do you try to manage both in the structure of the product and through other means, wh whether it's messaging or education, how do you manage that risk? Sure. I, I think the biggest piece is what we said at the end, it's education, right? It's the educational curve. And this is what you guys do so well. Um, but that's also what we've learned from people like you is like that negative carry sleeve is untenable for most people. So, you know, Spitznagel and Taleb would say, you know, you eat that 3% bleed in like a 97.3 portfolio because you're better off over time. And they just say, you know, toughen up and eat that bleed. But as we found, Nobody does that, right? We'll, we're happy to buy home insurance, car insurance, life insurance, but for some reason we won't buy portfolio insurance, right? No matter how good it is for us. So yep. learning learning that from people like you guys, we that was part of the initial structure that we set out is like, great, we all know everybody needs some sort of portfolio insurance or tail risk protection. But if they're unwilling to hold it indefinitely, it's a moot point. So we have to figure out a way to not hurt any of that convexity or that return from risk off to try to figure out a way where we're at least slightly flat or slightly positive carry so people won't get rid of it right at the worst time, right? So we think, you know, over the last, you know, five years, you know, every back test is hypothetical, that we've been able to achieve a positive carry during a risk on cycle, waiting for this risk off event to happen. But there are trade-offs, right? Like, so even though we're positive carry over those five years, in 2019, uh, our portfolio after fees would have been down like six and a half percent, right? And yeah. so that's more than the 3% carry. But the previous year, we would have been up, you know, twenty five percent. So it's you you get trade offs, right? And then you also yeah. have to you also have to then allocate maybe a little bit more to a, a strategy like Mutiny Fund than you would have to allocate to that three percent sleeve, or you have to use the cash efficiencies of futures to to overlay the strategies. And so the, there's trade offs to, to everything, right? And so yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not against, and you know, as I think both of us are in general are fans of the ninety seven three style. Of Universa, it's just it's been proven untenable for clients. So we have to figure out a way to, you know, a, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is, in, you're going to pay somehow, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're you're either going to pay in terms of uh, yeah. having a lower withdrawal rate because you need to 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 withdraw less money over time in acknowledgement of the potential for you know, regular 30, 40, 50% drawdowns, or you need to, you know, just, just pay this premium up front and be able to, in theory, withdraw more over time uh, because you've just got less risk of this. It's just like spreading risk through time rather than acknowledging that there's some yeah. unquantifiable risk in the future. And I just think it, um, you know, I, I think some people are wired to internalize that and, mm -hmm. It's it's a no brainer. I mean, it's nothing to me to underperform. You know, pick a benchmark, the S and P or the TSX or global stocks or whatever for for ten years is irrelevant to me because I'm focused on trying to maximize my expected return above my required rate of return for the minimum amount of risk that I take. But most people don't think that way. You know, I, I love the the term. I've never heard that before. Thanksgiving risk. But there's yeah. also cocktail party risk, right? Which yeah. is You've yeah. got to go to the cocktail party and you got to talk about what your portfolio is doing. And if you are lagging your peer group year in, year out, because you're, you, you've bought this insurance, yeah. eventually the pain is just, um, is just, is, is too terrible to bear. And uh, so, like you say, education is key. How are you guys uh, trying to get the word out? I've, I, I did go to your website. I know we correspond quite a bit over, over Twitter um, and you've got a podcast series Tell me about the podcast series and any other material that um, investors can go to to learn more about how, how you think about the problem. Sure. At mutinyfund.com, we have our, our Mutiny Fund podcast series. Or you can find Mutiny Fund on any podcast player. Uh, what we tried to do in the podcast series, we'll probably re-record the first four episodes because I think there's birds chirping in the background because we recorded outside of my house with Taylor and I. Um, but 
the first four kind of lay out kind of the thesis, the way we think about markets and long volatility. And then our, our, our subsequent podcast after that is interviews with actual managers we invest in because we're a, a fund of funds. So like we said, like we've been alluding to, we invest in, in different managers and different path dependencies for tail risk and long volatility. So we try to kind of deep dive as much as we can within regulations to talk about how those managers trade without quite giving up their secret sauce. So the podcast has been very helpful for us for people to kind of deep dive into what we do. Um, right now we're in the process of, you know, getting the Jobs Act passed, which will open up a lot more uh, marketing opportunities for Taylor and, and for him to pursue that. And he has a, you know entire game plan for that. Primarily it came from uh, Taylor's audience. And then uh, what's been nice is a lot of our managers end up passing through a lot of clients to us because they can't handle those lower ticket sizes. So it's like that rising tide lifts all boats. We're all in the same space. It's a small space. We're all trying to help each other. So at the end of the day, we're more like their megaphone to the retail clients. We're their cheerleader. And uh, we're just trying to lift the rising tide of that long vault boat, that tail risk boat. So, you know, it's 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 kind of that reciprocity there is where we get a lot of those clients. A lot of people reading, you know, Chris Cole's work um, come to us. A lot of people with Logica, with, with Wayne and Mike, they ended up, you know, if they can't afford their ticket items, you know, that's much more interesting to have an ensemble approach at a lower ticket. Um, so that's where we've been so far. And I think over the next, you know, subsequent months here and then going into the next year to 18 months, we're going to start rolling out a lot more marketing. And honestly, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to steal a lot from you guys because, <laughs> you know, between you and you, you and Meb, like that's that's the the high bar for what marketing should look like in, in, the, in the modern era. And it's always been shocking to us. And maybe part of it with this Jobs Act is that, you know, previously, none of these managers want to market. They know nothing about marketing. They don't want to market. A lot of them are QEP or QP, QP minimums because they don't want to market at all. They don't even want to talk to clients. And so we think it's, you know, the Wild West or there's enormous opportunity here for education. And, and th to your point, it's really that education curve. It's you and I believe that over time, you need to worry about your sequencing risk. You know, we never know we're going to need that money. So we need it to be there when we need it. And I think all this stuff with ergodicity these days and all that stuff are just fancy words for sequencing risk. And I think the, as these words and all these things come into the Overton window or part of the zeitgeist, it just helps all of us. And so I think that's why we all kind of feed off each other. It's because at the end of the day, we're trying to give the most robust portfolios to our clients as we can. So for all of us, it's not really competition, even though we're all competitive and we want to be the best, but we're all, we're all in the same boat and we're all just trying to do the, the right thing by our clients. And so I think it's it's always interesting to do these podcasts with you or to talk to Meb or talk to people that we may all be slightly different, but at the end of the day, we all have our clients' best interests in mind. And even though that education may be a longer slog than most people are willing to endure. Yeah, no, that's those are really good points. I don't know if you've listened to Patrick O'Shaughnessy's most mm -hmm. recent podcast with, um, I forget the guy's name who was on talking about bundling. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You listen to that? Yeah. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I sort of see... Um, what you guys are doing is a really great expression of this bundling concept, you know, like yeah. there's obviously there are super fans, there's super fans of Taleb and Universa and, and uh, Logica. And, and I think that's great, but I think there's also just a, a general perception of value. Of the, there's a nagging feeling of risk that can't be managed well using traditional portfolio tools. And so there's these sort of casual fans of tail hedging um, that don't really they can't really put their finger on. I don't really know how to evaluate which of these managers is is right for me. Um, but I'm a I'm a casual fan of of tail hedging, and what you provide is sort of a bundling of tail hedge managers that um, that captures the imagination of this these sort of casual fans of of tail hedges. And I think it's a really good a really good concept and maybe a, a, a good way to think about it. Um, how do investors? Actually, is it a 40 act fund, mutual uh, mutiny fund, or is it, what is the, how, how do how do you get access? Uh, technically we're a, a CPO, commodity pool operator. So it's just a Delaware LLC for direct investment, but we can also take in the US self-directed IRAs. We try to work a lot with Canadian clients. Um, there's some prohibitions there, but um, typically any investor worldwide can do a direct investment as long as they self-certify that they're gonna pay the taxes in their home country. Um, but that's, it's yeah, basically it's a commodity pool operator, direct investment through a Delaware LLC. And then you have the same provisions as you have for any CTA or CPO where we have those, you know, you have the CFTC, you have the exchanges, the FCMs, the prime brokers, um, you know, we have thankfully have zero access to your money. It passes through like NAV consulting, our third party administrator through CIBC 
And then yeah. we just direct which managers it goes to. And then, like we said, we have the SMAs with those managers sitting on cash positions. You know, we have all those redundancies that we love about the future space. I wish people knew more about managed futures to, to offset some of those like made off risks as you can see those daily trades and you can have fat finger protection, you know, against somebody hitting a button and trading a hundred contracts instead of 10, you know, you have all these provisions and provisos as far as, you know, cash covered cash efficiency from both the prime to the FCM to the exchange and those cash settled liquid markets are key to us. That was at the end of the day because it was to scratch our own itch. We wanted those cash settled futures markets. We don't want to take that OTC risk. I don't want to be worrying about an investment bank going down, um, but that also limits the trading sizes right over time. Are you able to access the, uh, the concept through an SMA if you don't want to go through the fund? Yeah, if uh, if just it's a function of ticket size. So, at, at have you certain, had any takers? Uh, yeah, we're we're in this, we're in talks currently for takers. We we're actually, you know, Rodrigo was just supposed to be our first taker, but you know, <laughs> he's got <laughs> yeah, a uh, he's got a team he's got to fight against. I don't, you know, wink, wink. There's going to be somebody at uh, at Resolve that's not a huge fan of what we do. That's right. Well, I, I know I mentioned in advance that for like Rodrigo just has tail hedging yeah. uh, to the core and the root of him. Like uh, not a not a investment conversation comes up that that is that doesn't have Rodrigo focused on tail hedge strategies. And you know, obviously that that is derived from his experience as a young person in a failing uh, state yeah. in Peru. But uh, it's good to have somebody with an eye on that ball. All right. Well, look, this has been absolutely fantastic. I don't know if you have any other uh, topics or, or issues that you wanted to make sure we covered today. No, I, th I think I'm good. I, I would probably just uh, turn it around, and just start asking you a bunch of questions. So probably <laughs> for the sake of time, yeah, it's, it feels weird to be the other end. I prefer asking the questions instead of answering them. Because as, yeah, as, we'll as, as we know, like none of us know the future. And so it's all pontification, right? And so you just try to build the most robust portfolio you can. Yeah, well, I really like the way you guys have uh, have thought about the problem. I, I wish you guys every success. Um, I, I'm intensely curious about how advisors and investors um, think about sizing and and you know quantifying the the where mutiny fund fits in portfolios. I'm mm -hmm. convinced of the role, um, and I look forward to carrying on this conversation. Where I mean, my views on this evolve. They evolve. Uh, even to the point in, in chatting with Mike Green and in, yeah. in uh, chatting with Corey about some of the research that he's yeah. done and, and chatting with a variety of other managers on this thing. I'm still wrapping my head around it. It's uncomfortable for me in general because of the fact that I like to deal in large sample sizes. So I think that's that's the major hurdle for me that you've got a, handle, a handful of regimes where this type, type of thing pays off. And then something we didn't even talk about, which is... Um, that the tails are not always expressed in the S&P. You know, there's right. entirely possible that we're going to get a tail event in uh, in bonds that is mm -hmm. that is not that is not expressed through uh, S&P risk. You know, you right. can very well yeah. have a a massive crash in Treasuries where stocks go up um, or stocks go down or stocks are flat. I mean, the episode in 2018 where we had this implosion in VIX and stocks barely moved. You know, was right. was it interesting? Uh, example of this type of basis risk. And, you know, portfolios are not just composed of stock risk. So it's, uh, all of these are fascinating questions. Uh, I don't have good answers, but I'm very interesting in continuing to learn more about it. So thanks again for uh, leaning into that today. And, and um, I look forward to further conversations. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate the talk. It was great. All right, you bet. Chat soon and uh, best of luck. See ya.